Good morning, Saints. Um, this morning, we're going to look at the, uh, the last message in this series on eschatology, the end of things and why it matters. And that last scripture song we sang really hits the nail on the head. He will make all things new. And that is the ultimate end where it goes on forever, that we will be with him in that new world. And that's a good thing to have on our minds as we look at this topic. So the last several weeks, we've uh, taken a quick look, and that has all it's been, a quick look at the four systems of eschatology, the view of end of things. And I mentioned in the uh, introduction to this series that one's eschatology is not a standalone doctrine that just hangs out there, but it is the outworking of the basic way that we look at Scripture. And our personal theology, <clears throat> including that of how it works itself out in our eschatology affects the way that we view things and how we live and it'll impact the way that we view the word of God and our life in this world so our main priority in all that we do studying the word is to keep Christ in focus he is the alpha and omega of our faith and of history itself so I want to emphasize again that while I hold to what I call the now millennium, I don't have a fight with sober-minded people who hold other views. This is not something that we squabble about. I'm not dogmatic about my view. I'm simply convinced of it. So if our view of the millennium is not so important, why did we take this tour? Eschatology is not unimportant, because it is part of what God has revealed to us in His Word. And everything in His Word is written for our edification, instruction, and so forth. So we can't just carve out eschatology and say, well, I can't understand all of it, so I'm not going to understand any of it. And what I've tried to encourage us to do, as I've taught through this series, is to keep Christ fully in view and to measure our view of the end times to see if it lines up best with the proper view of Jesus. And I'm convinced that what I call now millennialism does that best. There's this view that this is the current millennium and the kingdom of God is us while we are here and we wage war, if you will, spiritual warfare against the world as it tries to assault and, uh, you know, when Jesus said that the gates of hell would not defeat his kingdom, gates are defensive, not an offensive uh, measure. The church is on the offensive. And we, we do this by heralding the gospel wherever we go. And that's why I'm glad that we have at Community of Baptist, we have an evangelist recognized and he is part of our body and he takes the message into a very serious spiritual battle place that we know about in our state so this final this final message in this series serves the same purpose as the conclusion of a sermon answering the so what question in light of what we've learned how should we now live as francis schaefer might say so, as I mentioned, how we think about God, theology, and how we think about man, anthropology, affects how we live. And that's why it's important. To demonstrate this, I'll give you a little lesson from not too far distant history. In the early years of the 20th century, dispensationalism was the hot topic in a lot of circles. This nation's policy towards the infant nation of Israel were influenced to a large degree by dispensationalists. I read a letter from a dispensational Baptist preacher named Frank Morris that was sent in 1947 to Harry Truman, who was then president, encouraging Truman to do all he could to see to it that Israel in the Mideast was given that land that was theirs. One year later, Truman was all in favor of the new nation of Israel, and the idea 
that the Bible, that it was the rebirth of a biblical nation. And this idea that 20th century nation of Israel is the Israel of the Bible and is still owed prophetic fulfillment by God is the basis for the essential doctrine that defines dispensationalism. They elevate national Israel to a place only the redeemed in Christ have, and they reduce the inheritance of the Gentile states from eternal bliss to earthly struggles under a renewed Davidic covenant. And as you might remember Charles Ryrie, who I reviewed, he asserted that the separation between national Israel and the church is the foundation of his system. The result of this is his eyes are focused on national Israel more than they are, or at least as much as they are focused on the risen Lord Jesus. Because he said that the millennium was the fulfillment of God's redemptive purpose. That scripture song we sang, Revelation 21 and 22, that picture there is the fulfillment of God's redemptive purpose because that new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven to the new earth that God is going to make when Jesus comes down and forms all things new, that is the, the fulfillment of his redemptive plan. No matter how you see the millennium in this age, that's not the fulfillment. So we are instructed by Scripture to set our minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Colossians 3, 2, we have died and our lives are hid with Christ in God. And if that's with whom, in whom our lives are hid, should he not be the focus of our thoughts and our theology, even on the end of times? So here's a very practical example that I often use. Far too many Christians advocate sin management, although they don't use that term. There's very good solid teaching in the Bible about our need to mortify the sin in our lives. But if you focus on mortification of your sin to the exclusion of looking to Christ for your redemption and satisfaction, then you can be in danger of making your sin an idol and focusing on killing the sin and forgetting who put sin to death. So mortifying sin is a good thing. But to be obsessed with sin as you try to kill it and you cannot in your own strength kill it. So if you exclude pleading to God and Christ for his help and if you forget in him alone you have reconciliation with God, you can try to kill sin all day long and you will end up defeated. So this is why proper theology is Christ-focused. He has conquered sin and death. His righteousness is ours. He intercedes for us and He will come and take us to be with Him forever. I don't know that I agree that we're going to have mansions in the sky, but I do agree that He is preparing a place and he will call us to be with him forever. And I, I think that's on the new earth. I think that all the saints, when we die, the first death, we go to be with him in heaven, intermediate state. And we wait for the consummation of all things and the reconciliation and the uh, reunification of soul and body. And that comes at the end, truly end of the age when Christ really puts an end to time. So in a big picture way, that's the point. Where's our focus? When you think about life today, is your focus on Christ? When you think about how the end times are going to unfold, is your focus on Christ? And I, I told you uh, some post-mill guys and most dispensational guys uh, tend to be obsessed with what the news reports tell them and interpret Scripture in light of what they see on CNN and so forth. That's not the way that we approach this topic. Now, I have a friend who belongs to a mainland, mainline Protestant church, 
And he's told me that he's never read the book of Revelation. He says it terrifies him. Is that the reason that God gave us, gave us the book of Revelation? Is that the reason he gave us anything in his scripture to terrify us? If you're not in Christ, I can see how Revelation would terrify you. If you're in Christ, I think a right view of John's apocalypse should be to comfort you. Though we will have trouble in this world, and though the, the demonic forces will seek to destroy us, oh, saints, we have the clear promise of Christ ever present with his people, defending us and securing that which will not tarnish with age eternal life. So it is terrifying to be without the right clothes on Judgment Day. But how wonderful it is to have the God of all creation as your Father, your Redeemer, and your Judge. And He's your refuge. Now, most but not all of the arguments about eschatology revolve around revelation and how do you interpret it. It's been reported that most people mostly want to hear, or that's not the right way to say it, most people want to hear the Revel book of Revelation preached and taught on because they want to know what it says. And the same survey said most preachers don't want to preach from Revelation because they're afraid they don't understand it all. Well, I would say that none of us understand it all. But that shouldn't cause anybody to back away from it. Plead with God for understanding. I believe that the best way to look at Revelation is not as a puzzle book. How do all these pieces fit together? What do they mean? And are these animals really got ten heads and faces like lions and so forth? I think it's a picture book. I think in broad sweeping pictures, the Spirit is communicating through visions given to John. And here's the history of mankind, and it's wrought with horrible things men to do to one another. And it's, it's full of judgment that God's, God brings down on people who rebel against him. And oh, it does tell us the Lamb has conquered. And the Lamb, <laughs> He will comfort His people. He will save His people. Dennis Johnson has written a wonderful commentary on Revelation called Triumph of the Lamb. Now, that's, that's the image you ought to have in your head when you read Revelation. I, I often quote this because it's just imprinted on my head. Revelation 6, at the end of that chapter, all the kings and powerful of the world, people have been in rebellion against God, no repentance, and the day of judgment has come, and they call for the mountains to fall out on them because they find no place to hide, and they say, who will save us from the wrath of the Lamb? The, the, the Lamb of God saves His people and He meets out God's wrath on those who die the second death. So in his book, Triumph of the Land, um, Dennis Johnson says that God gave the apocalypse shown to John in order to bless us, to do us good, to convey His grace and to fortify our hearts. In Revelation, God promises his blessing seven times, a significant uh, number in uh, the Bible. Uh, the first two times in Revelation 1 and, 20, and Revelation 22, he uh, promises his blessings to those who hear and hold to the message in Revelation. The second one is or the third one, rather, is those who die in the Lord from Revelation 14. And the fourth promise is to those who stay awake and alert. That's from chapter 16. And the fifth promise is those who attend the Lamb's marriage supper, chapter 19. Number six is those who share in the first resurrection. Those people are blessed. And the seventh time, people are blessed. Those are blessed who wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. That's in the last chapter of the book. God gave the book of Revelation neither to tantalize nor to satiate our curiosity about his hidden timetable, but rather to arm us for the spiritual conflict we face every day. You remember when uh, 
Sebastio talked about Deuteronomy 29, 29, hidden things. We ought to be content with the revealed things because they're beyond our capability to fully comprehend. Well, that's kind of how like revelation is. There's things we're not going to understand about it. We shouldn't obsess about what we don't understand, but we should be determined to find out what can we understand. And I, can't, I think that's what Johnson is encouraging us to do, is to look therein to be comforted by God, to be fortified by God, and to be armed for the spiritual warfare that we face in this age. You can't even be aware of what's going on in the world without knowing that the world has declared war against the people of God. We're not called to simply hunker down in a bunker. We're called to suit up and go forth. And just as when Saul was persecuting the early saints, they scattered, taking the gospel with them. And so no matter how we are oppressed, the weapon we have is the one that gives life to those God is calling to faith in Christ. So Johnson provided seven helpful things to bear in mind as we ponder the message of Revelation. Seven things, and they're very practical. Revelation helps Christians see our situation in its true perspective. Revelation helps us see our situation in its true perspective. Appearances can be deceiving. How we often gauge how the war is going is by looking at the headlines and seeing what the political and the cultural and the economic trends and the global crises are, are doing. But the paradox that we see in Revelation's visions remind us that we walk by faith and not by sight. No matter what's going on with the gas supply around the world, no matter how bad inflation gets in the United States, <laughs> it's nice that we were recently taught that life is more than what you wear and what you eat. The kingdom of God is not food and drink. It is joy and peace and the power of the Spirit. Christ, the, the cross of Christ looked like the slaughter of a helpless lamb. That's what sight says. But faith knows it was the triumph of Judah's lion. And when faithful martyrs shed their blood, their foes appear to have won the day. But in fact, the martyrs are the true victors who have vanquished Satan by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony for their lo they loved not their lives even unto death. So having a faith-filled look at the world helps us see our situation in its true perspective. The second thing Johnson tells us is that Revelation shows our enemies in their true colors. Our enemy is stronger and savvier than we are. That great dragon, the ancient serpent, the devil, and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. But the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman has come and conquered the servant, the serpent, and ascended up to heaven. Satan can no longer accuse because we have an advocate. His charges have been silenced by the sacrifice of Christ. Frustrated over his defeat, Satan vents his wrath against the saints on earth. And his weapons are violent persecution. He's got the beast on his side. Plausible deception. He's got the false prophet on his side. And seductive pleasures. He's got the harlot Babylon on his side. Johnson says the sovereign state, the civil religion, and luxurious indulgences may seem to be saviors. But don't be fooled. Their aim is to destroy your soul. Revelation symbolism peels back the facade that often hides the grotesque hollowness of Satan's counterfeits. Babylon is cast down repeatedly in Revelation, showing God's victory over the system of the world. The third thing Johnson tells us is that Revelation reveals our champion in his true glory. And I don't we all want to see if you're in Christ, don't you all want to see Christ more clearly in his role as victor 
over that one thing that we need victory over more than anything else, sin and death. Who is going to save me from this body of death? Praise God, Christ Jesus. He is sufficient for you and I. The title of this book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ, and it unveils Jesus and fixes our hearts and hopes on him. Johnson said he's the hero of each dramatic scene found in the book. He's the son of man foretold in Jan Daniel 7. He's luminous in divine glory, who by his resurrection seized death's keys and now walks amongst his churches. He is Judah's lion who conquered by being slain. Paradox. Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, you must be the least. <laughs> he is Judah's lion who conquered death by being slain. He redeemed his people from all of the people of the earth, and he's worthy of worship from every creature everywhere. He's the captain of our salvation, riding into battle against his and our enemies, defending beleaguered saints and destroying the dragon and his beast. Our champion lifts our weary hearts with his promise, surely I am coming soon. And we reply, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So Revelation reveals Christ to us as our champion in his true glory. And the fourth thing, Revelation enables us to see ourselves in our true beauty. Now, you hear a lot of people say that you're depraved, you're wicked, you're a sinner. Well, if you're in Christ, you have been redeemed from such thing. And yes, you still struggle with sin. And yes, you still have some depravity in you. But you are not the person that you were before you were raised to life in Christ. Jesus' message to the churches in Asia show that his fiery eyes see us accurately. We can fool ourselves and think we're pretty good. Now, our spouses will help us see that a little more clearly, but Jesus has even better eyesight into our souls than our spouse does. He commends our faithfulness while exposing our flaws. Nevertheless, as modeled as the church's spiritual complexion is now, our bridegroom loves us and will not rest until he presents us to himself as a bride adorned for her husband, clothed in fine linen, bright and pure. He does this work on us as he prepares to bring this age to an end. And Revelation paints our coming wedding in such vivid colors that we ought to long to pursue the loveliness that will then be fully ours. To see him with unsinning heart, the hymn says. That ought to be our desire. So the fifth thing Johnson says, that Revelation summons us to endure as we suffer. This sounds a lot like what we heard last week at our conference. History will tell you that people who serve the Lord Jesus tend to be persecuted by the culture. Revelation was originally addressed to Christians who were suffering for their faith. Same as Peter's letters to those Christians in Turkey that we call nowadays being crucified and having their heads cut off behind they had this weird idea that there's only one way to peace with god and in in the roman religion you could practice christianity as long as it wasn't exclusive if you could say christ is lord as long as that l was lowercase and that he was amongst all the other lords and gods of rome and when Paul went to Mars Hill, uh, there was this one shrine to the unknown God. See, Romans 1 hadn't been written yet, but they were suppressing their knowledge of the truth by their unrighteousness. They knew there was a God they didn't know of. And Paul said, I'm going to explain him to you. He is the Lord who created all things. And he is not in need of anything man could do as if he needed anything that human hands could do, for he does not live in temples made by human hands. He was showing them that their religion was false. 
There's one God that is above all the lesser gods. There's one God who's got a capital letter to begin his name while the other ones are lowercase. So these saints in the book of Revelation suffered poverty, slander, prison, and death. And the dragon has been defeated by the work of Jesus on the cross. And he is in his death throes. And he, like any wounded animal, he gets more aggressive and more dangerous because he knows that death is nigh. And he escalates his assault, his assault against the saints until Christ comes to consummate history and put a final stomp on the serpent's head. Jesus doesn't promise a painless escape from the war of this ages. He promises his presence as the one who is alive forevermore. That's how he is our refuge even today. We suffer ailments. We suffer persecution. We suffer poverty, sickness, and death. Who is going to rescue us? The one who is with us this very day. We need to respond to the promise. We need to heed the king's call to be patient in our endurance. Be patient in your endurance is mentioned one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times in the book of Revelation. Be patient in this age. Christ is coming. Sixthly, Revelation calls us to stay pure when compromise invite, invites. Compromise always comes in the guise of welcome advice. And just as in our day, when we have some people who profess Christ, they compromise with the world because they want to be friends with the world. They're tired of being hammered by the world. In the first century, they faced a subtle threat that would ease the persecution. Satan, the father of lies, Scripture calls him, tried to mislead believers through those who taught false teachings and promised material comfort if you compromise with the pagans of the surrounding culture. It's the same thing as when Jesus was taken up by Satan and told, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world if you would worship me. That's the message that people get seduced by, even though it may not be as blunt is what Satan confronted Jesus with. Just make your services so that those who are seeking God don't feel put off by hard truths that the Bible has. Welcome people into membership who don't even confess that they believe in Jesus. And, you know, we'll just all get along. And you end up looking like the world having lost your first love. And we've heard a lot about unity lately. And that's how love shows up in the local assembly of saints. We cannot take for granted that the siren call of compromise doesn't await us right around here in Bear County and in Wilson County where I live. We must encourage one another as an act of love to cling to Christ, to look to Christ, to walk with Christ day by day. The devil's lies invite us to idolize pleasure and prosperity. It's the American way. You want to have a bigger house, comfortable pantry, nice car? It's the American way. You don't need to give so much money to the work of the saints around the world and in your local assembly. No, take that money and spend it on something that will be good for you. Revelation calls us to keep our hearts and lives pure as befits those who will be the Lamb's white-robed bride. See, is your, is your life reflected that your heart's desire is to be welcomed in? That last guy in, in the parable of the, uh, the big wedding feast, you know, people who were invited didn't want to come because they had stuff to do. And then the master said, go out on the highways in the hill country and you compel people to come in. That reminds me of John chapter 6 when Jesus said, nobody can come to the Father unless he is drawn. And that word from a Greek word that means like to draw a plow through the dirt. It's to compel. 
compel those people to come to my wedding feast because we will not of our own accord come. We must be, we must have drastic heart surgery applied to us. Our minds ought to be, I want to be where he is. That last guy who showed up, he wanted in there, but he didn't have on the right clothes. He loved sin more than he loved Christ. God help us. The last thing, Revelation encourages us to bear witness as God waits. God's not bound by calendars and clocks. And it seems like he's waiting a long time according to how we view time. But it's all working out according to how he's planned. When the last, when the last sheep is gathered from the last sheepfold way out yonder and brought into the sheepfold of Christ, the end's going to come. And we don't know when that is. We're to be faithful until that happens. So Johnson says that Revelation summons us to endure and stay pure and not to retreat into bunkers, hiding from the dangerous and defiling world. World, We need to heed the encouragement to bear witness to the testimony of Jesus. That's what the world needs. It needs to hear the testimony of Jesus. The word martyr comes from the Greek word that means witness. And John was on the island of Patmos, which was not the resort that it is today. He was on the Isle of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The church is symbolized in two witnesses who announce God's word, sealing their testimony with their blood. That's in chapter 11 and chapter 13. And Christ's witnesses suffer not in timid silence, but for their bold declaration that Jesus is Lord of all. Uh, there, are, there are those who say, up in Oklahoma, there's, there's the, the largest Protestant church in the world based in Edmond, Oklahoma. Craig Gorschel is the senior pastor, so-called, of this church that's comprised of over 120 campuses around the world to which Mr. Gorschel projects his image and his voice of an undiscriminating, unsaving love for people to have a good time in their life. He and, he and Joel Osteen would be very closely related theologically. This is the message the world wants to hear. Oh, there is a God and he wants me. Well, there is a God and he does want some, but he doesn't leave you in your sin. And a message that doesn't talk about our need to be rescued from the wrath of God that is stored up by those who love their sin is not the gospel. The gospel is good news to those who hate their sin. It's not news at all to those who love their sin. It is judgment against them even though they don't recognize it as such. Through our testimony, through your testimony, God is fulfilling, is fulfilling the vision of Revelation 7, where we read, Behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's the message we have. That's the reason that God is glorified in his people when we're faithful to the message he has given us. And that's really the theme of Revelation. He gave us this book. He gave us the whole book and he gave us Revelation not only to inform our minds, but to transform our lives. And it gives us insight into the realities of, of our situation of our enemies, of our champion, of our true identity, and it calls us to patient endurance, hopeful purity, and a courageous, bold witness to the world. Now, you recall in the introduction maybe that I, I mentioned that we should pattern our ex eschatology after Abraham. He and his kin didn't receive the land that was promised to them. 
They considered themselves strangers and exiles on this earth. They had opportunity to return to that land, but the Bible says they desired a better country that was a heavenly country that is built on better promises. Because of this, because their desires were for that heavenly country, the scripture says God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a heavenly city. That should be our perspective of the end times. Details, details, details. Do you desire that heavenly country built on better promises. Some people think that we should seek a return to the land that Abraham left. Abraham didn't see it that way, but some people think we should. Some people think that our king would once again come to earth and face the rebellion of sinners. But I think that when he comes a second time, he's going to subdue all those who are opposed to him. And he's going to judge the nations as he gathers his people and makes all things new. The author of life draws a line between two countries, the country of the earth and the heavenly country, or as Augustine put it, the city of earth and the heavenly city. And he reminds the saints of the blessings and responsibilities that accompany our citizenship in heaven. Paul says we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. That's where our citizenship is today, as we are aliens in this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. Hebrews 13, 10 says that we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. Now, have you ever wondered about what that passage means in the context of Hebrews 10? I think the altar mentioned here is Christ. We have Christ and the eating here is mentioned believing on him, which is what he was talking about in John 6. And it is signified by the Lord's Supper. And the, those who serve the tent, the earthly tabernacle, those who want to go back to the shadow religion of sacrifice of animals and temple worship and so forth, they have no right to. If they, they do not bear true repentance and faith unto Jesus Christ, they have no right to this altar of the body of Christ that serves us eternal life. When the kingdom was taken from national Israel and given to a people who will bear fruit of true repentance, the people known as, as Israel lost their standing as a people. And they are now people who need Christ, no different from the rest of the world. They were different from the rest of the world while they were God's covenant people. And when that covenant was put to an end, Hebrew said as being rolled up like an old garment, ready to vanish, their status was changed and new Israel was identified. All those who have faith in Christ, whether they be Jew or whether they be Gentile, ethnic Jews need Christ they don't need a rebuilt earthly place of worship. I've been reading a book by Charles Hill where he examines patterns of millennial thought in early Christianity. And he describes, he's got this one short paragraph that describes this. Unlike the kingdom anticipated by insurrectionist Jews and dreaded by the Romans, the kingdom of Messiah already exists, but it is heavenly and angelic not of the world or earthy. When Christ brings this kingdom to, kingdom to earth, it will not extend the life of this world with another transitional and partial kingdom. Rather, it will arrive at the end of the world when he would come in glory to judge the living and the dead and to reward every man according to his deeds. With an eye towards this, Here's a few short passages from Scripture that I pray will help us comprehend how to live now. Nothing is more practical than clear instruction from the Word of God. And speaking of Israel's history, Paul said, Now all of these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the end the ends of the ages have come. 
Every Christian has the complete canon of Scripture written for us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. That's a funny phrase. John Gill has, the, has uh, made the case that this doesn't mean the end of the material world, but the end of the Mosaic Covenant and the end of times of Gentile blindness and ignorance as the light of the gospel expanded over the globe. This the new age that we live in is the age of some people call it the age of grace. It is the age where the gospel is given free reign and Christ is able to penetrate the darkest corners of the world with his gospel message to bring all of his sheep back to his sheepfold. And since we live in this time looking for the return of Christ and how we live in this time until he comes matters a great deal for us because we don't want him to be ashamed of us at his coming just like he was not ashamed of Abram and those people. So we want, to, we want to live our lives to honor him, not to give those outside any cause to curse our father. That's the clarion call throughout Scripture. Don't. Noah was called blameless because he didn't give the world a reason to curse God. That's how we ought to live. Matthew 6, we heard this recently from somebody who was preaching up here. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and seal, but lay up for your treasure, for yourselves rather, treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. So you remember the teaching that Kyle gave us. You know, our, our heart's desire ought to be for things that are heavenly. So as we pray for those saints that are ministering the word in Chile and in Serbia, Siberia rather, and in other places of the world where maybe you and I don't even want to go, right? But may, may the word of God prosper there. Let, it, let our hearts be tender. Let our billfolds be open for those people who press the gospel in places we cannot or will not go. 2 Corinthians 4, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to those things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient. But the things that are unseen are eternal. It's not wrong to have a nice house. It's not wrong to have a reliable car. It's not wrong to have comfortable clothes. But let not these things grab hold of your soul. There was a time when these things had hold of my soul. It's not good. When you, when you come to a true understanding of who Jesus is, as that hymn says, the things of this world will grow strangely dim because they are transient. And no matter what kind of affliction you're suffering today, it is a light momentary affliction that is beyond all comparison. Because these things are transient. The, the illnesses that bother us and the wealth that we have, they're transient. The things that we cannot see with eyes of flesh, that we see with eyes of faith, these things are eternal. And he wrote, Paul wrote in Colossians 3, If you then are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on those things and not on things of the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ our life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. See, if you are Christ's, when he comes in glory, you will appear with him. You are on the side of victory. Though for a while now, it looks like defeat is our lot in life. We are victorious, brothers and sisters, and he will not lose a single one of his sheep. The last one I'll read to is, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. 
Is the hope of Christ alive in your soul? He has birthed in us. He has given us a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, the resurrection, <laughs> if you don't have the resurrection, your hope is in vain. The living hope we have is given to us through the resurrection hmm. to an inheritance un incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved for you in heaven, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Salvation is a thing that was accomplished. Salvation is a thing that is being worked out. And salvation is a thing that will be displayed for all to see when Christ comes and His saints are revealed to all the world before judgment takes place. Each of these short passages reminds us of the temporary nature of this age and the eternal and imminent nature of the age to come with the exhortation to be heavenly minded. Be heavenly minded. Those who say, those who warn you, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good have got that flipped upside down. You cannot be good to the world. You cannot be good for your own soul unless you are heavenly minded. So don't listen to the logic of the world. Listen to the truth of Christ. Knowing our standing in Christ, deliberately seeking to keep the eternal plain in sight is the biblical means to our stability and usefulness while we yet have time here. And if this is God's will for us now, why would he give us a temporary short-lived earthly kingdom to draw our attention back to this earth before the consummation of all things? That's my question. So another author, Kendall Lankford, summed this up, speaking against the common view of dispensationalism. Do not spend your life staring up into the heavens. You will be there soon enough if you are in Christ. And do not waste your life terrified and perplexed about the news of our day, straining your eyes for secret fulfillments of prophecy, afraid that someone will persecute you, worried that you will be left behind. Spend your days serving Christ, Use your talents well. Don't bury them in the sands of eschatological fear and speculation. I like that phrase. Run the race that Jesus has given you to run and stop letting internet charlatans whip you up into an end times frenzy. Peter said the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's the bottom line, children. That's the bottom line, brothers and sisters. Serve one another. Be sober-minded. Be self-controlled. Be in prayer. When Jesus comes back, it will be the end of all things as we know them. For when He returns, it will be to judge the nations, to gather His people, and to make all things new. He will dwell with us on the new earth forever. On the new earth, we will all be 25 you know, it'll be it'll be good. It'll be better than 25. We should seek to live soberly in this age, seeking to herald the Savior to all men, seeking to serve the brotherhood in love and to bring honor and glory to our Lord. This ought to motivate us to walk day by day as children of the light to bring Christ glory because to Him alone is glory and dominion and honor and power. And that's the end of our study of the end of things. And that's why it matters. Let's pray. Father, I do thank You for the, the pictures that You've given us in Revelation that 
you would use John's words of these visions to show us that Christ is supreme over all things. And while the world rages against our souls, oh, we have that that sweet promise that he is our refuge and our ever-present help. Let us fix our eyes on him and do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. While you give us life and breath this day, may Christ be glorified. Amen.